Good morning and welcome to St. Paul's Bloor Street. Let us pray. May God's word be spoken, may God's word be heard, and may God's word be lived today. Please be seated. Last month, Canada and most of the British Commonwealth celebrated the Queen's Platinum Jubilee. And perhaps some of you watched the early morning military parade, or you watched the tribute concerts, or at least you had the idea to take a marmalade sandwich and put it in your handbag, just like the Queen. But what was most fascinating of this entire weekend, this celebration, was all the variety of names that were given to this one woman. Elizabeth II, by grace of God of the United Kingdom, Canada, and her other realms and territories, queen, head of the commonwealth, defender of the faith. And some of you, some of, us, some of them will also say, you know, the proper Her Majesty and her close friends and family call her Lilibet. I'm sure you heard that. The younger ones might call her grandma, nan. But the rest of us here, maybe we just call her the queen, like there's no other queen in the whole world. But all of these names, they have a special meaning. They have a special relationship that they mark. So today, as we continue our summer preaching series on the Apostles' Creed, as we dive into these 12 fundamental statements that summarize what the church and Christ followers believe, I believe in God Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. Jenny started our series with the critical first two words of the creed, I believe. And then Tyler followed to show that because God is love, we can call the creator of the universe, we can call this God, Father. Now we turn our attention to the one who revealed the Father to us, that is Jesus Christ. As Tyler mentioned last week, many people claim to believe in God, full stop, but it is yet another thing to believe in Jesus. This part of the creed is the longest, dedicated to Jesus, and we will spend actually a few weeks looking at these other lines. But this week, we start with names, Jesus' names. If you're a longtime follower of Christ, or perhaps you're not sure Jesus existed in history, you may have other names for Jesus. Or there's other baggage associated with that name. But Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, isn't just a heaping of honorific titles, of flowery phrases. They are, in fact, a very precise statement of who Jesus is. So this morning, we're going to explore together what these three special names for Jesus, what they mean and why they matter to us at all. First, when we talk about names, I'm sure naturally some of, you, some of you are thinking, what's Jesus' real name? Like, what's his first name, middle name, last name, the one that he would put on the passport after waiting hours in line? Because Jesus Christ doesn't tell us anything about the human family of Jesus or his earthly parents, Mary and Joseph. It's the equivalent of saying, Justin, Prime Minister, or Elizabeth, Queen, in fact, surnames are often just like that. Maybe some of you have those. Baker, Taylor, Mason. Even the Jewish surname Cohen literally means priest. Rather, Christ was a Greek translation for Messiah, which meant to the nation of Israel, the anointed one. The Messiah or the Christ was the one promised to Israel prophesied by the Jewish prophets of old to restore God's chosen people. And many in Israel had their hopes set on a powerful military leader who would def defeat and expel the Roman colonizers. You could think something like Harry Potter with the scar on his forehead marked as a baby, battling the evils of Voldemort, or someone like Anakin in Star Wars, the one prophesied to bring balance to the force. But Jesus was not who they expected to be this Messiah, this Christ. He had a ragtag band of followers, not an army, and he preached peace and mercy. 
The hopes of his followers were dashed when he was tortured and murdered. And it was only after his resurrection, rising from the dead, that his disciples started to understand that Jesus was indeed the Messiah, the Christ, this chosen one, anointed one of Israel. Those disciples began to experience liberation, but not from Roman oppressors. This was freedom from spiritual oppression, the spiritual oppression of death and sin. And there is a lot to talk about Jesus' death and resurrection, but we have to save that very big discussion for a few weeks down the line in our series. So many people, believers, non-believers alike, would say that this historical person, Jesus, lived on earth 2,000 years ago. But if we just stop there, I believe in Jesus, there wouldn't be too much impact on our lives. It'd be like going to the ROM down the street and saying, I believe in dinosaurs, and I do. But it doesn't change anything in my life other than gawking in an amazement at their amazing size. And maybe you've gone a step further with Jesus, and now you believe that Jesus' peace teachings, his example of love, that these are excellent models of how to live your life. But that only puts Jesus on a rank scale with other great humans in history, like Buddha, Gandhi, Rosa Parks, and maybe Jesus is just the best human ever. The Apostles' Creed continues in its declaration that this Jesus Christ is God's only Son, the only Son of an Almighty Father who created heaven and earth. But these titles, Father and Son, they're easily clouded by our experiences of our own human fathers and the good or bad parent-child relationships that you might see around you. Besides, fathers and sons, they don't always look alike. They don't always have the same interests, attitudes, personality traits. So why does the Apostles' Creed even bother to say that we believe in Jesus, God's only Son? So thankfully, in our scripture reading, the Apostle Paul writes to the church in ancient Colossae to remind them of the special divine relationship between God the Father and Jesus, God the Son. Many of us, maybe we call ourselves children of God because God does love us and He wants an intimate relationship with us. So then we were adopted into God's family. Adoption, this gift that we get from God given to us. But Jesus is uniquely God's Son. Because as Paul writes, Jesus is the image of the invisible God. When we see Jesus, the man who lived in the first century, we also see God the Father, who is invisible. Paul continues to write that in Jesus, the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And here we hear an echo of what God the Father says when Jesus is baptized, anointed by the Holy Spirit. This is my Son, the Beloved, with whom I am well pleased. God loves His Son, is pleased with His Son, and the full divine Godness of God is in Jesus. And back to Queen Elizabeth. For those online, you might need to zoom in, but... The easiest way to know how Queen Elizabeth looks like is to take a coin and take a look. That's an image of the queen. And it's not a very good image of the queen. You know, it's no color. It's not very good. It's a few years old. It's only one side of her face. But no matter how good you might make that image, you might improve it. You might have a painted painting on your, on your wall. You might have a 3D video. No matter what you do, the queen will never just suddenly appear in front of you in all her pastel brilliance and shake you by the hand. We have an image of the queen in our pockets, on our screens, but the fullness of the queen is found in one person living at Buckingham Palace. So when we see Jesus, we see God, and we see all the fullness of God in Jesus. When God acts, Jesus acts. And just as Tyler preached about God the Father being God the Creator, Jesus was also there at creation. 
Paul writes to the Colossians that Jesus is the firstborn of all creation and that all things have been created through him and for him. Once again, this is not flowery hyperbole because God existed before time. The Trinity existed before creation. Jesus is the beginning. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, this divine community of love, were all part of creating the universe when God said, let there be light. So, if Jesus is God's only Son, and He is, because He proves Himself through the resurrection, more on that later, then by rights, He must be the Lord of the universe. In Jesus, all things in heaven and on earth were created, things visible and invisible. This this includes all creation, all matter, all creatures, you and me. And when we go through the hierarchy of authority and power, maybe the mayor of Toronto, the prime minister, the UN secretary general, in Jesus, all these rulers and powers were created. And when we see the leaders of the world, the powers that control and influence global trade and politics, wars and conflict, perhaps it is reassuring that these powers and rulers, these these mighty men and women of the world, will eventually answer to the Lord of Lords, to the King of Kings, the Lord of the universe. But if if I am being honest with you, if I am being honest with myself, this is where I want to stop. I believe in Jesus, the Lord of the universe. I want to believe in a powerful Lord who will root out corrupt officials, who will restore the planet from climate change, a Lord who will finally break open the chains of systemic racism. Sign me up. I believe in that Lord. But the hardest part of this line is that we believe in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Not just the Lord of the universe cleaning up the mess out there. The Apostles' Creed declares that Jesus Christ is my Lord, our Lord. And this is the hardest part because we don't like bosses. I have a great one. But we don't like people telling us what to do. Just think, if we get annoyed when the traffic light tells us to stop, or we get annoyed when our smartphone, our smartphone blinks 5% battery and screaming for a recharge, think of all those bigger and heavier things in our lives. Maybe you don't drive, maybe you have a, a new phone that never needs a charge, but we all have bosses, work bosses, the hockey schedule for our kids, the holiday demands of our in-laws, our bank balance, the like button on Facebook and Instagram. All of these bosses have expectations, requirements that they impose on our lives, and we feel disappointed, embarrassed, let down when we fail those expectations. We feel reproach or shame because we let someone down. We failed. So the common solution these days, be your own boss. Call your own shots. Set your own hours. You know, maybe you're an entrepreneur exactly for this reason, to be your own boss. You don't want to answer to anybody. Or you're climbing the corporate ladder into management because you want to be the ones giving orders down. And even if you're retired, you know, enough years with enough bosses, you still answer to someone. You're answering to yourself now. And what we expect of others, we expect even more for ourselves. So all of us committed believers, curious visitors today, we all share some type of conviction or belief about how we should behave, how we should live our lives, expectations that we place on ourselves. But then your friend is in need and you let the call go to voicemail. Or you yell at your kids exactly in that way you promised that you never would. Or you can't forgive the bigot on the street corner or the one in your family. 
when you look down on the immigrants that don't look like you or the immigrants newer than you, we fail our own expectations. We judge ourselves, and then we feel guilty of our own convictions. In another letter to the church in Rome, Paul feels that same tension. I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. I can will what is right, but I cannot do it. We want to be our own bosses. We want to say what's right, what's wrong. But even when we set the standard, we still miss that, stand, that target that we set for ourselves. So if you work with a boss that blames and shames you, who sets deadlines that can't be met, or if you're weighed down by the anxiety and weight of your own expectations, there is good news. New York pastor and author Tim Keller writes, Jesus is the only Lord who, if you receive him, will fulfill you completely. And if you fail him, will forgive you eternally. You see, Jesus, Lord of the universe, is also the firstborn son of God. He is the older brother to all those who call themselves children of God. He is the perfect older brother who will present us holy and blameless before God. And this is why all these names and titles matter together. And here's the hardest part, maybe, but also maybe the easiest part of the creed. We are not looking at an argument right now. This line is not just an argument. It's not a statement that demands our agreement. We are face to face with a person who demands our confidence. As God's only Son, Jesus Christ is already the Lord of the universe. But de jure and de facto must match. Since Jesus is Lord by rights, by who he is, he must also be Lord by fact, as Lord of our lives, my Lord, our Lord. He could invade our lives and come into our hearts by force, but that is not his way. So regardless if you are a lifelong follower of Jesus or you're still Googling more about who he really was, I'm sure that there are areas in your life where Jesus is not Lord. Not yet. Or maybe he was and not anymore. Your bank account, your circle of friends, your plans for your kids, your career aspirations. Perhaps in your mind, in your intellect, you believe but your heart is still hedging, holding on to little pieces of control. Jesus does not want to be a ceremonial king of the universe, a constitutional monarch like the queen, where you and I are prime minister to make all the, the real decisions of our lives. Jesus, the Lord of the universe, wants to be the absolute Lord of your life. Will you call Jesus my Lord, the Lord of my life. So before I close, I want, us, I want all of us to take a moment to think of one or two areas in your life where Jesus is not Lord. Jesus wants to be the Lord of your entire life to fulfill you completely in all the areas of your life. Let's take a moment. Father God, we thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ. We thank you that he is Lord of the universe, that in him all things hold together. And so we pray for those struggling to let go. Show them that Jesus will fulfill them completely. For those struggling with the shame of failure or their unmet personal expectations, 
show them how Jesus has forgiven them eternally. For those seeking with questions about the purpose and meaning of this world, show them that Jesus, this Lord of the universe, this Lord loves them. And for all us who proclaim that Jesus is our Lord, my Lord, make us like Paul, a servant of your gospel, that we would say, your will, nothing more, nothing less, nothing else. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord. Amen.